Hey, well, welcome to Refuge. We are so glad you're with us this morning. I'm Pastor Jeff. I'm one of the teaching pastors here at Refuge. A couple, God, you were so good. Uh, we know that you have done a work in our junior hires this weekend. Uh, Lord, we know that maybe they came home to rough family situations or, or rough school social situations. Uh, we know they come back home to busyness of life. Uh, and, and yet for this weekend, you, you took them away, you gave them a retreat and a rest, and Lord, just a, a time centered on you. And so Lord, I pray they would not quickly forget that. Lord, would you continue to use this weekend as a, as a stepping stone in their life uh, in, in getting to know you more and who you are as Lord and Savior. And so I pray this, this weekend would have a great impact on our junior high group. Lord, I pray for a safe trip on the way home. Lord, would you just give them traveling mercies? May you just give them grace around them and bring them home safely. Lord, we also pray this morning as we've come here, we've braved the, the rain, uh, Lord, to enter into these doors and into this building, Lord, because we believe we're going to hear from you. Uh, Lord, we come with expectant hearts, ready to receive uh, from the living God. And Lord, we believe you do that through your living and active word. So we're going we're gonna to preach your word. And Lord, we just want to be attentive and soft-hearted to the things that you would speak to us this morning. So Lord, would you do that? Would you open our hearts and our minds to the things of you? And Lord, I, I would also just pray, Lord, that if there's someone here who's never uh, really truly grasped who, who, who you are, Lord, who your son is, Jesus Christ, then maybe this morning would be that testifying moment, uh, Lord, where, where Jesus speaks to them directly, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would speak to them directly. Lord, I pray for that time, or our time in the word this morning. Amen. Amen. Uh, from time to time, as I walk around the halls of refuge, I'll bump into to young guys. Some of them I've had in high school youth ministry. Some of them maybe just come into refuge, and I'll just kind of ask them, like, how are, thing, how are things going in your life? And, and they'll start to share about things going on in their life. And then I, I notice something, a, a, little, a little gleam in their eye. And I'll say, so when did you meet her? <laughs> what, when did you meet this girl? Because there's something different about them. And, and, and they're a little bit glowing and, and they're excited. And, and I ask them, how, when did you meet her? And, and I, tell me about this girl. And they'll go on and on and on and on about this girl who they've met who is so special and she's so cute and she, she does this and she loves the Lord and she do, all these, this checklist of things that they could just go on and on about. And I could totally relate, because when I met Bethany, my wife, I felt like the same thing. Like, this is, I found her. This is the one. And I could just brag about her for, forever. And when, so, like, when people would ask me, so tell me about Bethany, I, I could just go on and on and on and on about Bethany. And so I can relate to them. Maybe for you, it's not like maybe someone you have fallen in love with, but maybe it's just someone who you really admire, that if somebody were to ask you about this person, you'd be able to say, man, they've had such an impact in my life. And you could go through this checklist of, oh yeah, maybe it was a parent, maybe it was a grandparent, maybe it was a, a youth pastor <clears throat> at one point in your life that just had profound impact over, yeah. Maybe it's a youth pastor, maybe it's just someone in your life who you would say, man, this person had such a huge influence over my life. And, and sometimes when we start sharing about this person, maybe we get even a little emotional because it brings back the, the memories and the power that, that, that they had in our lives to just really help us when we needed help or give us advice when we needed to give us advice. Well, as we travel through John, uh, the, the book of John, the gospel of John, and that's where we're going. So if you're just joining us for the first time, welcome. Uh, we're at the very beginning of John, John chapter 2, and we'll take it all the way to the end, John chapter 21. So stay with us, join us in the study of John. But what you're getting in John is this. John has had such a powerful influence, and influ Jesus had such a powerful influence over John. That, that John felt like, I, I've got to write this down by the power of the Holy Spirit and the influence of the Holy Spirit. John says, I want you to know my Jesus. I want you to know what I know about him and what I experienced with him. In fact, John's checklist would just go on and on and on and on. And I imagine if you were to talk to John in person, he would get emotional over the things that Jesus taught him and the role that Jesus had in his life. It is that big of a deal to John. In fact, it's such a big deal. If you would, turn with me to John chapter 1 in your Bible. John chapter 1. Verse 
John chapter 1, verse 1, all the way at the beginning of John, John wants you to know something about this Jesus that huge, had a huge impact in his life. In fact, it's a big deal. Look what he says in John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, who do we find later on that is the Word? Who's the Word? Jesus is the Word. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Listen, in him was life, John says. Listen, I want you to know this, readers, listeners. What I found in Jesus was life, and the life was the light of men. So when John is talking about his Jesus, he said, I could go on and on to just know this. Here's what I want you to know about him, that he was in the beginning, and that he was with God. And that he was God. That's what John says about Jesus. So if you're a first-time listener, first-time comer to to refuge, and you've never heard that before, John is making this bold statement that Jesus Christ is God. In fact, he goes another further. He says, in him all things were created, and without him nothing was created. That's the statement that, that John is making about his Jesus. He will go on and write and write and write. We'll study over those things. But I want you to see what he says. Here's why I'm writing this. John says, here's what I want you to know about this, and I will just read it to you since this is the worship slides. <laughs> All right, John chapter 20, verse 30, here's what he says, and truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, right? Did lots of other things which are not written in this book. I could have kept writing, he says, I could have kept writing and writing and writing, but I didn't, they're not all recorded here, there's more. But he says, I did write these, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. In other words, I'm recording all these things. Everything I've written is so that you would do what? The B word. What is it? Believe. And in in believing that you would have life in his name. In other words, your life was once here, but you believed in Jesus. Now your life is over here. It's different. It's a different sort of life because of what you believed about Jesus. So John then says, let me give you some more evidence as to what I believe about Jesus and who I know Jesus to be. And so we pick up our text here this morning in Chapter 2, verse 13, and this is what it says. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. Now, before we go further, let's get the context down. What It's Passover, right? And Passover is a big deal for the Jewish people. In fact, it took them back about 1,400 years when God had rescued them out of slavery in Egypt. Hundreds of years of slavery, by the way. And remember, God sends plagues onto the face of the land in order to pull his people out of Egypt. But the last plague, he sent the angel of death to go over all of Egypt. And those that had the blood of the lamb on the door, the angel of death went over, and those that didn't lost their firstborn son. And this moment was so big that the the Pharaoh in Egypt said, get out of here, (laughs) get out of my land. The leader of Egypt says, get away. After hundreds of years of being used in slavery, he tells the Israelites to go, just get out of my land. And so they leave. Now the Jews for over 1,400 years celebrated this moment of being released from slavery and bondage in Egypt and getting to move on to the new promised land. Now, this is the same thing that they're doing now. They're coming back to Jerusalem as they did every year to remember the Passover. Now, Jerusalem at the time, people say, was a couple hundred thousand people that lived in Jerusalem at the time. But when Passover came, when Passover came, They said over a million people would flood the streets and all the rooms were filled, right? Now, keep in mind the context. As Jesus enters into the temple gates, right, the temple temple courts, it's packed with people. And there's people he probably passed on the way in because Jerusalem is flooded with people. The second thought here is he says he entered the temple. Now, what's the temple? What's the temple all about? The temple is the central place of worship and identity of the Jewish people. 
It is the presence of the Lord with them. They are alone have the temple, and that temple is in the holiest of cities in Jerusalem. So Jesus is coming into Jerusalem. He's going into the temple, and he sees two things. What are the two things that, that John says that he sees? Animals, right? Animals and money changers. Animals and money changers. Why are they inside the temple? Why are they inside the temple courts? Well, because people would come from all around to offer sacrifice for their sins, for atonement on Passover. Now, what the people did, the religious authorities of the day said, you know what? Rather than having people have to carry their animals from all around the world, right? Have them just buy when they get here, right? That's the idea. Let's have animals ready for them. And then they can just buy the animals here and they go sacrifice them. That's the one reason that we see the animals in there. The second reason we see money changers is because people also had to bring a half shekel of temple tax. Now you might think, well, what is that temple tax all about? Where did that come from? Actually, God said that they were to do that all the way back in the day when they left Egypt. All the way back in Exodus uh, chapter 30, verse 13, which I will just tell you is incredible to me. Think about it. All the way back, listen to this heritage that they have, right? All the way back when God says, I'm going to rescue you out of the land, then he lays out some laws for them. One of the things he said, and we'll read it here in a second, was have, have the young men bring a temple tax when they come to help the upkeep of the temple, of the tabernacle. And they carried that with them all the way to the New Testament of doing that same thing year after year, Passover. Oh, don't forget the half shekel, right? Don't forget that. Listen to what it says, Exodus 30, verse 13. This is what everyone among those who are numbered shall give. Half a shekel according to the shekel of the sanctuary. The half shekel shall be an offering to the Lord. Everyone included among those who are numbered from 20 years old and above shall give an offering to the Lord. The rich shall not give more than the poor, shall not give less than the half shekel. When you give an offering to the Lord to make atonement for yourselves... And you shall take the atonement money of the children of Israel and shall, appoint, and shall appoint it to the service of the tabernacle of meeting, that it may be a memorial for the children of Israel before the Lord to make atonement for yourselves. And they carry that on and on and on for roughly 1,400 years. It's an incredible moment. So th this is a special moment for them. Hey, we've been doing this for 1,400 years. And Jesus walks in and he sees the animals and he sees the, and the money changers are there because people would come with all different types of currency from wherever they were coming from. And the temple would require a certain sort of currency. And so there had to be an exchange. I have to turn my money into temple currency. And so the money changers are there to make it easy for them. Hey, come on on, come on in, right? We'll exchange your money into the temple currency so it could be used in the temple. So then the question then becomes, why did Jesus get so angry with this? And some of you know this account as we read further in verse 15. Jesus does something that seems to be so out of character than the loving Jesus that we know, right? Look at what he does in verse 15. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned the tables... And he told those who sold pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. What made Jesus so angry? It says it right there. Don't make my father's house a house of trade. Now, keep stay there for a minute. What happens then is possibly, quite frankly, I, I believe there's two temple cleansings. There's one at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, and there's one at the end of Jesus' ministry. Some people believe there's one, and John is just moving it into an area of his text that makes sense for his writing. Uh, I believe there's two very easily. I don't think that the Jews, after getting reprimanded by Jesus once, are like, oh, okay, we shouldn't do this anymore, right? I, I believe it's totally possible. They're like, is he gone yet? All right, let's get all back in there. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's all get back in there again. <laughs> He says, listen, I think there's two temple, temple cleansings, right? Listen to what he says at the sec second temple cleansing. He doesn't say, don't make my father's house into a marketplace or a house of trade. He says, you have turned my father's house into a den of thieves and robbers. 
Here's why I think this is important. I think that both times he could have said, listen, you have made my house into a house of a, a, a den of thieves and robbers, and you have made my father's house into a marketplace. I'd be both times the same thing is going on, right? So why then is Jesus so angry? Well, I think just first off, right, the temple's making some money. When people had brought their sacrifices from home, they made it, I believe, difficult for people to receive that sacrifice. In other words, I would bring my, my animal from home and they would say, you know what, ah, that's got blemishes. That, that's not good enough. We've got animals here for you to buy. So come buy these animals, maybe even at a marked up price, right? Come receive these animals. You have to use these animals. And over time, people would just have thought, well, what's the point of bringing our animals from all the way from home when we'll just have to buy them there anyway? Oh, okay, let's just buy them at the temple. A little money being made off the people. The money changers, what do they do? Hey, we'll exchange your half shekel, but it's going to cost you something. But in Exodus chapter 30, it says, listen, each person, no more, no less, poor or rich, they bring a half shekel. So now all of a sudden, I'm not just paying a half shekel, I'm paying whatever increment of increase of exchange they would charge me, whatever the exchange rate would be. And now all of a sudden, there's money being made off the people who are coming with genuine hearts of worship, desiring to praise his name. And now all of a sudden, the temple has become a business. I think that's number one. Because he says, listen, you've turned my father's house into a den of thieves and robbers and a marketplace. The second thing I think he happen, that happens to be is that as he walks in that day, the expectation is that this is more than likely the court of Gentiles that he, you first enter into. It would go court of Gentiles, court of women, court of Israel, and then into the court of the priests, the smaller one. So as he walks into the court of Gentiles, what does he see? Animals, money exchange. What goes along with animals? Sounds, smells, right? into the court of the Gentiles, where Gentiles were called on to come every year and worship and praise and pray to the Lord. And Jesus sees this place being taken up by the marketplace, by people making money, by animals, by money changers. And in his heart, he has to be thinking, this isn't right. Uh, my, my father, he loves the Gentiles. In fact, he's reaching out to them through the Jewish people. And somehow, when it comes to the temple context, they become second-class citizens because their court is filled up with mar the marketplace. Now, a Jewish woman or a Jewish man could go into the next court. Ah, oh, no marketplace. Thank goodness we got through that mess back there, right? And they could have that time of worship and prayer, but the reality is the Gentile court had been turned into a marketplace, and in fact, it was being used to make money off the people, to exploit the people. Really, what I think Jesus saw was irreverent worship. This idea that somehow what was supposed to be revered in this moment as they came for Passover of all days into the holiest of places to pray and to worship, Jesus sees these people selling things. They had prioritized money over worship. Jesus is angry because I think what happened is the condition of the temple reflected the condition of their hearts. The condition of what the temple looked like reflected what was going on in the Jewish practice of worship, if you would call it that. And he was broken and he was angry over it, that people had turned his father's house into a place to make money. In fact, I think what he would say is their hearts had gone far from the Lord in understanding, like, why would you not understand that this is not okay that, that people who are coming to worship are, are met by people trying to make money off them, or, or people who've come to pray are met with animals in their place of prayer. And, and you don't even see that. And you're not changing it. It's probably been going on for so long. So Jesus walks into that scene upset and angry. In fact, I think he reflects our Father's heart. And I think you get a small picture of what that looks like from our Father in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 11. This is God talking to his own people. Listen to what he says to them. What are your multiplied sacrifices to me, God says to his people. I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who requires you, of this, tr who requires you this trampling of courts? Bring your worthless offerings no longer, God says to his people. 
based on what their hearts look like. And this is Old Testament. This is Isaiah telling his people, Israel, listen, God's not pleased with where your heart is in worship. Listen to what he goes on and says. Incense is an abomination to me, new moon and Sabbath, the calling of the assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity and the solemn assembly. I hate your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts. They have become a burden to me. I'm weary of bearing them. So when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply your prayers, I will not listen. That's the Lord, the heavenly father, Yahweh, speaking to his people because their, their practice of, of sacrifice and burning incense and celebrating certain holidays had just become that. Callous practices. There was no reflection of the heart there was no love for the Lord in their hearts. And Jesus, I believe, sees that as he enters that temple mount that day. He's like, ah, oh, here we are again. Here we are again. God's people making money off people. God's people not recognizing the moment that what this is supposed to be is holy surrender and brokenness before their Lord. Remembering a, a, a day of Passover, of, of God's cleansing, of atonement of sins, and here they are out making money. And I think Jesus' heart was broken. I think he was angry. It's interesting, too, that, that the Jews thought the Messiah, the Christ, would come and elevate them above the Romans. Like, he will rescue us, and he'll go after those Romans. But listen to what he does on the holiest of days, in the holiest of places, who does he go after? Them. The Messiah comes after those that are playing religion, but hearts are broken and actually are leading people away from the truth of the Lord. Because if you're a Gentile in that day, can you imagine walking in those temple courts and think, what do they think of me? As, as I've come to worship the Lord and here I'm having to pay money and more money, and, and what do they think? Like, I don't want to do that. They're actually ushering people further away from the Lord. So the question then is, what does John want to tell us this for? John, why are you sharing this with us? Because I think what John wants us to know about his Jesus on his checklist of the things that he loves about Jesus is that Jesus has authority even over the temple. Jesus has authority even over the temple and over the religious system of the day. Jesus could step into that like no one else could. No one else had the power. No one else had the name. No one else had the authority to step into the, those temple courts that day and say, uh-uh, not in my father's house. No one else could do that. But Jesus did. In fact, it's key in what he says. He says, do not make my father's house a house of trade. Why is he able to say father? I mean, because you and I call God father. He's our father, our heavenly father. But when Jesus says, this is my father, he means something completely different. Like, he means, I am his son. <laughs> I am his son. I am the son, is what he means. In fact, we can see that, because later on in John chapter 5, Jesus is going to say this again. He's going to call God his father. And I want you to see what they say about that. John chapter 5, verse 17. Jesus had done some work on the Sabbath. Not totally cool with the Jews to do work on the Sabbath. Uh, and Jesus answered them, my father has been working until now, and I have been working. Jesus and the father working together as one. Verse 18, therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because not only he did not only broke the Sabbath, but he also said that what? God was his father, making himself equal with God. You see what he did there? When you say, God is my father, you're not saying, I am also God. When Jesus says, God is my father, and you have turned my father's house into a marketplace, what he's saying is, I'm coming on behalf of the father, equal with the father, as his son, telling you that this is not okay. See, Jesus, John wants us to know, Jesus comes with authority over that temple. Jesus comes with authority over that religion. And he says, listen, I am the son. <laughs> He is my father. Huge implication to that. And so I would just say maybe someone listening here who doesn't know Jesus very well or, or maybe has an idea that Jesus was a person or that Jesus was just one of the prophets. Jesus makes high claim 
if that's for you this morning, I want you to see that text in John chapter 5 and see that Jesus makes a big claim there. Equality with God. And in fact, all the people around him of the day thought that's what he was saying. It wasn't like, oh, he made a mistake. Just let it, let it go. Let it go. No, it's like, hey, we actually want to kill you <laughs> because you said that you were son of God. And so those of you maybe who think Jesus was just making simple claims or the Bible just makes simple claims about Jesus, Jesus the Bible makes big claims about Jesus. And guess what? Jesus makes big claims about Jesus. He says, he's my father. This is my father's house. In fact, John uses the disciples to even point it even closer. Look at verse 17. Here's what the disciples took from that moment. Here's what, as they stood back and watched their friend, right? Jesus go crazy with the temple. Here's what they said. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Isaiah, uh, uh, sorry, Psalm 69, 9. Psalm 69, 9, David pens this. Here's what David says. Because zeal for your house has eaten me up, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. And the disciples, seeing all that's going on, they're saying, listen, that's David. That's King David, the one we revere that is so impactful in our religion, in our tradition. King David once said, The zeal for the house of the Lord has eaten me up or it consumes me. And then we see Jesus walk into this account and he says, they say about him, the zeal for the Lord actually consumes him as well. There's something unique and different and special about our Jesus. That he's serious about holiness. And in fact, David was writing this at a time where people were coming against him and coming against the Lord, and he was just trying to call people back to worship again, back to genuine worship. And so Jesus is doing the same thing. He's taking in the same line of David. He's saying, I'm calling them back to worship even though they reproach me, and they're going to hate me. Two questions about this text that I would ask you. Number one, think about it as as a big Z church. And and we're a little C church, refuge, little C, but there's a big global church. And the question we need to ask ourselves, is there anything that that would represent those temple courts, those Gentile courts that we've done that have prevented people coming to the Lord? Is there any barriers that we've set up that we've required of people that just God would say, no, 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 not in my house. No, no, that's not the most important thing. Is there anything that we have set up that makes it hard for people to come and just just worship and to praise him and to honor him and to love him. I think that's a question we always have to be asking ourselves, both as the big C church global and the small C church refuge, is if there's anything in our ways that prevents people from coming to the Lord, then we need to make sure that we get those out of the way because Jesus comes with his zeal and says, I'm going to turn those things over. I don't want those things to be a part of my house of my father's house? The second question I would ask is personally, inside of you. Is there anything that you would say, man, God wouldn't want that inside of my house. God wouldn't want that in his courts. And Jesus, with the same authority that he went to the temple that day, would come to you and say, listen, by the authority vested in me, right? By the authority as the son of God, I would cast that out of your life. Don't have that in your life anymore, Jeff. Empty it. Get it out. He would turn those tables over and say, get that out of your life. Is there anything that he would say, is that in your life? That he would say, get rid of it. Don't let it stay. Because here's the deal. Jesus is zealous for his father's house. He's passionate about what is going on inside his father's house, inside his father's temple. And the question is, if if you're a believer in Jesus then you're Jesus's. And he's passionate about what's going on inside each and every one of us. I would say he's this passionate. He's whips and and table turnover passionate about getting things out of our lives that don't belong. And so the question is, do you have that same zeal? And maybe that's the prayer. Lord, would you give me that same zeal? I I know that that I want to honor you rightly. I know that you've called me to live a life that honors you as a man or a woman of God. Is there anything in me that, that is, is not right? And if so, give me the zeal and the passion to clean out the temple courts. Give me the zeal and the passion to get it out of my life. 
John's not done yet, though, uh, because you can imagine as he turns over tables and kicks animals out, kind of disrupts the religious system, right? <laughs> Things aren't going to go well. In fact, they're not going to be too happy with that. Like, Jesus, we've been doing this for, for some time, and who are you to come in and, and, and disrupt things, right? Listen to what he says in verse 18. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? What's your credential? What allows you to just walk in and turn over tables? What is that? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, come on, man, <laughs> right? No, they said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? Then John gives us insight, and it's not insight that he would have had or anyone would have had in the moment, but it's insight afterwards. It says, but he was speaking about the temple of his body. First off, they say, listen, if you come in and start messing things up, what power or authority do you have to do that? Which Jesus has all the power and authority, but they want to know, do a sign, prove yourself. Prove yourself that you are someone who's allowed to come in and mess up our religious system. To which he says, listen, here's your sign. The temple gone, and in three days I will raise it up again. To which they all were scratching their head. Like, what? how do you do that? There's a 70-ton brick that makes up part of this temple. What are you going to do with that? How is that going to get uh, broken down and then put back up again in three days? We've been doing this for 46 years. Notice that there's no pause in them. There's no reflection in them like, oh, wait, maybe we shouldn't put cattle and money changers the place where people are supposed to worship. There's no pause for reflection and, and, and thought like you would think a godly person would do. They would be like, oh, wow. I mean, all these years we've been, we've been having animals in the place where people were supposed to come and focus and their attention on the Lord. There's no pause for reflection. It's more like, so who are you? Like, who are you? How can you say these things? Show us something. Prove yourself. To which Jesus does not prove himself. In fact, in Matthew 12, 39, listen to what he says. But he answered and said to them, this is another time where it's like, hey, prove yourself. An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. You remember the prophet Jonah all the way in the Old Testament? Now, here's an interesting thing, because people are like, oh, that's just a story, right? That's a fable. That's a fairy tale. But Jesus didn't think it was a story or a fairy tale, right? Jesus says, you remember what happened with Jonah. Like, it's legit history for Jesus. He says, listen, the prophet Jonah, as, for, as Jonah, it was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. If you want a sign, he says, just wait. Just wait. I'm not going to just perform signs for you right now because you've said, oh, prove yourself, right? I don't need to do that. But I will prove myself. Just wait. The temple down, destroyed. In three days, I will raise it up again. Now, this comment that Jesus makes is radical, and it stays with him through his entire ministry. In fact, the comment about the temple being destroyed and raised in three days goes even past his ministry. I want you to see these. He's on the cross, right? Of all places, you think people would be like, oh, let's honor the man who's dying, right? But no, they come and mock him, and listen to what they say. Mark 15, and those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, ah, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. They remembered. They remembered the statement. Oh, this is the, this is the guy. He's the guy that said, but now look at him on the cross, right? They remembered the statement. Listen to this one. This is actually Stephen. It's after Jesus's death and resurrection and the church has started. And Stephen is one of the first martyrs of the church. And listen to what they say about Stephen, uh, Acts 6, 13. They also set up false witnesses who said, this man does not see speaking blasphemous words against the holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses lived to us. Even still, they were remembering, Jesus is the one who made that comment. One more. Jesus in front of the Sanhedrin, 
right? And they're coming after him. And listen to what it says. Then some rose up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. I will build another made with hands. Out hand. So what is Jesus saying here? Number one, this statement will stay with him and it'll stay with them. But Jesus was like, great. I want it to stay with him so that in the moment when they remember what I said, there will be belief and there will be faith. Now Jesus is saying, I'm talking about a temple that's not made with hands. We'll look at that in a second. But I want you to see what the disciples said about this moment. Look at verse 22. Did it stick with him? Did the statement stick with him? Look at verse 22. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Did that statement stick with them? Absolutely. In fact, I imagine it being something like this. They're sitting there. It's after the resurrection. They're talking about, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit would bring to remembrance things that Jesus had taught. And as the Holy Spirit is is amongst them and they're talking, there's that time someone stands up and says, remember we were were at the temple that one day and Jesus just goes off on the Jewish religious leaders and and the money changers and he kicks all those people. Remember that? That was a crazy moment. But do you remember what he said after that? And and they would all say, yeah, because... People keep bringing it up. Hey, you're the people that followed Jesus who said he was going to destroy the temple and then raise it in three days, right? And they said, but you know what? I just made a connection. What was the connection? Like light bulb on. He wasn't talking about the temple. What was he talking about? He was talking about his body as the temple being raised in three days. And they would all have been like, oh. And the, John says, yes. They believed the word of God and they believed what Jesus had said. John is saying, listen, I want you to know this, that Jesus has power and authority over the temple, right? But he's also got power and authority over death. And here's the proof. Those that heard him talk about it three years prior, and he's, several times Jesus mentioned the idea that he would die and then raise again from the dead in three days. But those that were with him, it says here in his gospel, after he rose from the dead, what? They believed. That's our B word. They believed. Those that walked with Jesus, they believed. So what kind of temple was Jesus talking about that he would raise from the dead? I just want you to see this quickly because it says it's not a temple that was made with hands, but it was a temple that was what? Made by God, (laughs) right? It was Jesus's body. And, And so for them, the temple is the dwelling place of the Lord. The temple is the place where we go and make sacrifice. The temple is where we go and worship. Jesus would later be called in Hebrews the great what? High priest. He is the one that atones for our sins. Jesus is is the new and greater covenant. He's the new and greater temple if you would. In fact, here's something that's so cool. Jesus invites us to, and, and, and I don't know if you remember this, but it, we'll study this later on. It's the Samaritan woman. He says, we're not going to worship on this hill or on that hill. It won't just be all about Jerusalem anymore. It won't be about the one big temple. In fact, God's going to do a major work in my resurrection. I'm going to be raised from the dead, and there's going to be this new spirit-filled worship. That they're gonna wor- people are going to worship in spirit and in truth. And so Jesus then says, hey, come, come, look at this. And, 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 and later on, Paul will coin, coin it like this, Ephesians 2, 19. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners. You're, you're fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Gentiles, Jews, you're fellow citizens. You're part of this family. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Now, key in on the language, foundation. Temples have foundation, right? Buildings have foundation. He goes on. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone by which all the other bricks take their lead. He is the chief cornerstone. He is the main building stone. And then all the other stones come off of that chief cornerstone. It offers guidance and direction in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into what? A holy temple in the Lord. 
that this no longer is going to be one temple. In fact, it's going, to, it's going to be people walking around who are in relationship with the Lord because of who Jesus is as the chief cornerstone, and they become part of this massive God-building project in whom you are also being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. It's an incredible reality that he took this thing that was central to Jews, central to Judaism, central to a place in Jerusalem, and he says, listen, this is going to disappear. And when my resurrection happens, I will become that chief cornerstone, the dwelling place of the Lord. I will atone for your sins. You don't need to go to the temple anymore. I will take care of this. You don't need an animal sacrifice anymore. And John wants you to know all this about Jesus. Because actually, in 70 AD, that temple gets decimated. And there is no animal sacrifices anymore. And then what do you do with sin? Where do you atone for sin? Jesus says, listen, I'm the, the new covenant. I'm the better way. Follow after me. Become part of God's holy building project. And then I'll close with this. Here's what he says. He, and he closes our section off this morning in verse 23. You see... John wants people to know that Jesus is the authority over the temple. He's got authority and power over death because he will raise from the dead. And then he says this, listen, verse 23. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man for he himself knew what was in man. Check this out. Jesus is preaching, doing signs, and people are believing in him, but the Bible says that Jesus was not believing in them. <laughs> We're always like, oh, believe in Jesus. And Jesus, it says here, I know man's heart, and I'm not going to entrust myself to them. It says they believed in Jesus, but Jesus did not believe in them. In other words, what Jesus saw in them was a surface level of faith. Now, I think it was, it was like a, a step forward. It was like, hey, I like what I see this guy doing. I see, it says he, they saw the signs, and it says they believed, but what did they believe? They didn't know Jesus. They just knew what he could do. I like what Jesus can do for me. I like what I see him doing. I'll, I'll take that step of faith. But John is going to call people to a deeper faith. Jesus is going to call people to a deeper faith. The rich young ruler, sell everything you have and give it to the poor and come and follow me. Oh, gosh, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. Not that kind of faith, right? I don't believe that. I mean, that's crazy, right? Or, or hey, let your, my father passed away. Let me go back and, and bury my father. No, let the dead bury the dead. Come and follow me. Oh, I don't know. This is... Ah, there's some challenge to that. That's, that's another step. And, and, and remember the seeds, the parable of the seeds. And, and they fell all over the place. And, and the word of God going out. And some fell on hard soil. And some fell on the side of the path. And some had birds come and, and rob the soil or rob the seeds away. And some fell on good soil. And it grew and grew and grew. And Jesus is going to ask people to say, hey, listen, you believe in what I can do, but do you, know, do you believe in who I am? You believe on what I can do with the signs and the miracles, but do you believe who I truly am? And so that, Jesus is going to say, take another step with me in faith. Walk with me in faith. It says that he did not entrust himself to the people. The other side of this, why did, was able, Jesus able to see all that as he looked out on a crowd? Why was he able to see all that? He says, it says he knew what was in man. He knew what was in man. There's only one person who knows what's inside man. Who is it? It's God. In fact, there's a couple of scriptures, lots of scriptures. I'll just read two. Uh, 1 Kings 8.39 says this, Then hear in heaven your dwelling place, and forgive and act and give to everyone according to all his ways, whose heart you know, for you alone know the heart of all the sons of men. Talking about God. Then he says in Jeremiah 17, 10, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doing. And there's other scripture. But the idea is this, only God knows what's in man. And here comes Jesus. And John wants you to know that, that his Jesus, this Jesus that he's fallen in love with, this Jesus that he's saying believe in, he knew as he was talking to people what was inside of man. 
He knew that their, their faith wasn't deep. In fact, the next couple of weeks, we'll see Nicodemus. And he'll actually know something about Nicodemus before Nicodemus knows something about him. He'll see the, woman, the Samaritan and the woman at the well, right? And he'll know something about the woman at the well. Jesus has this divine attribute that he seems to be able to know what's going on inside of man. And John very clearly writes that so that you will know that Jesus is not just any average guy. In fact, he's got authority in the temple. He's got power over the death. And just like Yahweh, just like our, his heavenly father, he knows what's in man. And so then he would say, I'm writing all this so that you will believe, so that you will know his Jesus and you will put your faith in him and you will begin to walk after him and follow him. And in him, listen, John, John says, you will have life. That it's not just a mental assent to some idea of Christianity, of saying, oh, I believe in the resurrection, I believe in Christ, okay, now I'm good, right? But he's saying, no, no, it goes so much deeper. That's the start. But then walking with him and living life for him, you will have life, both in this life and in eternity. And John's saying, that's what I want. John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world. We're going to read that. That's in John. So if you know that passage, come with us in a couple of weeks. We'll talk about John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever should believe in him, believe in him, shall not perish but have everlasting life. And I pray that as you hear this text, you would say, ah, I need to walk more closely with that Jesus. I want more of what John has, that love that he has for him. I want to know more about him. And so Let's pray about that this morning. Let's pray over that and just say, God, would you draw us in? Would you, would you call us deeper into relationship with you? God, we're going to do that right now as a congregation. We're going to come humbly before you. And we're going to say, God, if there's anything that's not right within me, I want to be zealous towards those things. I want to get them out of my life so that I can walk holy with you. And maybe, maybe somebody for the first time is, is hearing the truth and the reality of, of Jesus' claims of who he is and, 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 and people who walked with him and who they believed him to be. And Lord, I pray that would make a lasting impact on their life so much so that they would dive deeper into understanding Jesus and who he is. For those of us that know him, Lord, thank you. Thank you for your grace and your mercy that you've shown through him to us that we truly have life in you. Lord, thank you for that opportunity to know your son and to walk beside you, filled with that grace, filled with that mercy, Lord, that you provide for us. Amen. Great word, great word, amen. I I think we all today need to say, Lord, please enter the courtyards of my life. Those courtyards, those things that we kind of look at on the peripheral, on the outside, you know. We think, well, I've got my worship down, you know. People say, I got my worship on. I got my worship down. But there's those courtyards that Jesus wants to walk through. And maybe, like Jeff told us uh, today, be willing to say, God, if there's any table that needs to be overturned, anything that needs to go. I had to, I've never thought about this before, but I had this kind of, you know, mental vision in a couple of months. Some of us are going to be in Israel, and we're going to go to those southern steps of the temple. And as we sit there, uh, I'm going to make you turn around and look at this one archway that's been all boarded up, not boarded, but uh, blocked in. And that used to be either the entrance or the exit to the temple. And we're going to turn around and just imagine money changers and merchants pouring out of there and animals coming down those steps because Jesus has said, get out of here. So if he says there's anything that we need to let go, just let it go. Let him purify our hearts and our and our lives. It's, that's what we do. Amen. Um, families share things together and uh, Jeff is right at the tail end of uh, you know kind of a, 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 a respiratory thing or you know some coughs and just congestion so he graciously gave that to me and so I'm thankful I didn't have to preach this weekend so families do that and the other thing families do is they say happy birthday to members of their families so would you guys say happy birthday to my beautiful daughter Shannon <laughs> love you amen So grace and peace be upon you as you go serve Jesus and let him just cleanse, purify, 
and fill you with the Spirit, and just let's go do what He's called us to do today. Amen? And, and by the way, since it's going to happen tomorrow, if you want to say happy birthday to Joy on your way out, that's tomorrow too. And so they share, we share a lot of things in families. Big, big, big February for us. Grace and peace to you. Bless you. Have a wonderful day. This has been a presentation of Refuge Calvary Chapel Huntington Beach. For more information about our ministry, please visit refugefamily.com or call 714-891-9495. Set free.